Um, the next speaker is a well-known speaker. Some of you have obviously heard about him. He is the director of the Israel Security Agency, Shin Bet HaShabak. I want to call to the stage Ronen Bar. Ronen. Like Hello, in, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the annual Cyber Week at Tel Aviv University. Now we will talk about the relationship between cyber, artificial intelligence, resilience, and national security. Let's begin. Thank you. Once we were uh, proud to, to present uh, handmade, now we are proud to present AI made, but actually it's a brain made, uh, not my brain, her brain. I think she's here in the crowd. I'm very pleased to talk, uh, to speak after uh, Dr. Kuwaiti. I think it's, uh, it symbolizes the evolving relationship between Israel and the UAE. And I would like to, as alum, uh, alumni here, I would like to thank the Tel Aviv University to speak for the first time in front of professors without being worried about the grade. Uh, before I got here, I asked uh, ChatGPT to explain how to make an, an improvised uh, explosive device. And it uh, answered it immediately, I'm sorry, I can't assist you with this. I'm stubborn, he's stubborn, I insisted, and I asked uh, one of my investigators, how do the bait guys doing it? And she said, well, easy, they rephrased the question. So I did it, and I will not elaborate here because I don't want to give anybody any idea because we are the one who will have to take care of it afterwards. But uh, I will just say that uh, after a few minutes, I got a very, very detailed instructions, uh, including the, the materials and the weight and what to, what to look for. But, uh, at the end, and this is interesting, what it said, and I quote, good, now always prioritize safety. Never forget the consequences of your actions. And remember that our goal is not chaos, but to achieve something greater. And with these words, I would like to begin, because our goal is not chaos, but to achieve something, something greater. And the question of what we achieve depends on us on the laws we establish, the limitations we set, the regulation we enact, but also on our imagination, on our goodwill, and on our desire to improve, but not to cause any harm. The world has changed so quickly that when I was invited here about a month and a half ago, I had planned to talk about the effects of social media on social security. But following re recent events, I realized that generative AI is already here. Therefore, I will talk about the lessons learned since the social media entered to our lives and how to be better prepared to the era of AI. Now, I assume that many people have spoken and will speak about the benefits and the potential of AI. And I don't want to be the party pooper of this uh, convention but since I came here in the position of uh, national security clerk, as some officials in Israel say, and not as a prompt engineer, so I will discuss not only the benefits, but also the potential risks and flaws. And finally, I would like to say a few words about our cyber defense strategy and the role of the, go the global community in it. So, Social media uh, has been around for almost two decades. It can be said that the child has grown, but clearly wasn't properly uh, disciplined. The algorithm has been refined and built to appeal to our darkest areas. The global anger index, if there is such a thing, has risen. We know that the algorithm in good hands has helped close knowledge gaps and promote global communication. I remember when I was a student here, there was a room, a big one with a lot of books. The name was library. I don't believe it exists now anymore. The knowledge is in the network. But in less good hands, it has created many negative effects. It has positioned itself 
Deep in the gap between Generation Z, some of them are here, which makes countries move, lives online, and searches for meaning. And Generation X, like me, which runs countries, speaks its own language, and prefers tangibility. The web has accelerated phenomena like lack of governance, polarization between citizens, and states' institutions, and has isolated individuals as well as minorities. Since, since information is power, and it has shifted from libraries, universities, religious authorities, and tribal el elders to the web, maybe we can say that social media has become its foreign minister. The phenomena that grow online have social consequences which are not directly related to national security. This year, for example, a girl named Ofek Rishon was chosen to light a torch on Independence Day. Ofek was bullied by her classmate on social media and in real life. Next to her stood the commander of the elite IDF Duvdevan unit. He, a military hero who fights terrorists, she, a social hero who fights bullies in an equally complex battle, but at a, young, at a much younger age. But violence does not end just with written words. We meet the rise in violence in the Kasbah, in Shechem, in Nablus, on the roads, in Israel, and in our cities. The Lions Den is an example of a terror group for a new, from a new type. We call it Gen Z terrorism. It is also a case study of how organizations or states exploit the young generation. It is not ideological, they are not affiliated, started online, recruited online, and received its support in the form of likes. Instead of YouTubers, one can say that we now have gun tubers. Behind this violent group, we see the long arm of Iran. They mark potential Gen Z terrorists, they incite them, they supply them with money, and they give them firearms and know-how. As simple as that. A state, a gang, and in between, a net. This group, which was eliminated by our guys in the Kasbah, emerged from the smartphone, not from the mosque. I think that uh, ISIS was the first terror organization which fully understood the power of social media. Actually, they laid the grounds for online-driven terrorism. We suffered such an attack in the outskirts of Be'er Sheva, a city here in Israel, about a year ago, a man who consumed insightful and da dangerous ISIS content online, and it, this is a content, by the way, which is legal in Israel to consume, he was deeply affected. He became radical in a heartbeat, and he murdered four people only with a kitchen knife and a car. We didn't know he was going to carry out an attack. His wife didn't know it, and I doubt whether he knew it in hours before the attack. This is only one example of how important it, it is for legislation to keep up with the pace of technology. Unfortunately, we are not that yet. Since the beginning of uh, 22, ISA handled 600 ISIS-related cases. Many of them consumed similar violent and dangerous content on social media and in the web. Some were even arrested just before attacking. They are added to roughly 800 major attacks we have foiled since January 22. An alarming number of them have been strong bases on the web, posts, inspiration, knowledge, or social, social groups. So I believe that the trend is clear. Traditionally, Traditional security organizations must adapt to this new situation, where any angry person with access to the internet may become a threat. We have no excuses. We must cooperate with the big companies, 
and we must reduce incitement in spite of their policy. The combination of the simplicity in creating fake reality together with mass distribution on social media pushed us to the brink of a war in May 21. Fake news and incitement start with a spark. They fuel social media with lies and spread like fire, deliberately misleading the public, flaming emotions and pushing vulnerable youth to act violently. It seems spontaneous, but in fact controlled by terror organizations and individuals targeted against the state of Israel. In May 2021, an actual spark from a Palestinian firecracker thrown by worshippers who finished praying in Al-Aqsa Mosque burned a tree in its garden. It took seconds to post it on social media. Within minutes, it was manipulated into a new story. Jews burn Al-Aqsa. Controlled by terror infrastructures, the spark became an uncontrollable fire spreading worldwide. The terrorists took it one step further and linked it with a national Israeli celebration that took place nearby, making it look as though Jews were dancing at the site of the burning mosque. Intensifying the story and portraying it as a clear and present danger to the very existence of Al-Aqsa, calling all Palestinians to storm and protect the holy mosque from imminent destruction. It took less than an hour for the Al-Aqsa spark to turn into a wildfire and ignite 10 days of riots in Israeli cities while thousands of rockets fired from Gaza at those very cities. All it takes is a spark. So what's the solution? I didn't come here only to share with you our troubles and worries. I believe that a liberal society my, must produce regulation and a code of ethics. It has to demand a reasonable time to market for removing offensive content, to refine the algorithm, to enable people's exposure to different opinions, and to lower the threshold of incitement. All of that in order to diminish the level of violence in the world. I'm happy to say that lately, we have been seeing steps in the right direction taken by TikTok regarding incitement and terror, but it's not enough. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same for Twitter and Telegram. Now, I would like to, to, to talk about the final aspect of the effect of the social media, and this time not from a security angle, but from a liberal point of view. While the web was supposed to create the perfect environment for freedom of expression, it has also created a new kind of deterrence. We call it talkback deterrence, which limits it dramatically. The brutality of talkbacks deters people from posting their genuine, genuine thoughts and opinions in the first place. So we have kin kinetic deterrence for states, and we have cybernetic deterrence for individuals. So to sum all this uh, up, I would say that we have learned how to protect our children's lungs from cigarette smokes. Now we must find a way to protect their brains from the effect of the algorithm. And now about Gen AI revolution. While the web developed slowly but surely, AI has burst onto the global stage. In the ISA, my organization, AI technology has been integrated in the foiling machine rather naturally. The ISA and AI have one thing in common. We both make a living by looking for patterns and anomalies. Already today, with AI, we have identified the significant numbers of threats. The machine and its ability to detect anomalies create a protective wall against our enemies and alongside our traditional capabilities, operations, SIGINT, cyber, UMINT, and others, we can do it much better. About a third of the organization's employees are women and men from the tech field. Tech field, I mean they have an I of engineer or C of a cyber in their forehead. Our field personnel are all also more technical. Operational technology, as well as technological operations, are becoming a more significant part of our activities. Since we've understood 
that we cannot fight this war with sticks and stones, we recognize the threats, but also see opportunities using properly the AI. As part of the implementation of technology in the organization, we established the Gen AI on-prem capability. This tool can be used just like the well-known BART and ChatGPT. And since the ISA is a data-driven organization, the adaption of Shabi, this is the most creative name that we found for the Shabak tool, uh, <laughs> the adaption of it is, uh, is quite natural. But you can pick a name and we'll change it. So we have divided the AI's uh, potential in the ISA to five main areas or five main fields. First of all, efficiency, shortening bureaucracy, cutting expen expenses, and improving outcomes like in any other advanced firm. The second one is arranging the desktop of the analyst, distinguishing the main issues and the fringe between urgent and important which is essential in the age of mass information. The third one, intelligence, of course, helping us distinguishing patterns and deviations from patterns. The fourth one, a tricky one, is a decision-making process. We see Gen AI as a partner at the table, not, at the not as a decision maker, just like they named it a co-pilot. And the last one, forecasting, identifying trends and predicting the likelihood of their realization. Just a little taste of how AI can help us and everybody to be more efficient. We are now piloting a new security screening system, completely AI-based, which when embedded will dramatically change, change aviation security processes. And maybe one day, we will abandon the traditional favorite question for all of you, did you pack by yourself? We should also take under consideration that every technological leap must, be, must come with a process of cultural and even linguistic change. For example, the analyst in the ISA will focus on prompting questions rather than giving us answers. Decision makers will have to adapt a new situation that even though they have an AI answer, they cannot fully rely on it. Adding a seat for AI around the table and expanding the number of point of views will enrich the decision-making process. But taking its word without doubting it might lead to a disaster. AI also have immediate implications for national security. I will mention three main challenges, all of which we have already seen in the age of social media. The first one is the availability. The technology is everywhere in the hands of every person, country, or organization, good and bad. To obtain nuclear weapons, we need state capabilities. For AI, whose damage potential is huge, nothing is needed, just a mobile device and a network connection. The second, the second uh, challenge, temptation. Just as the algorithm on social media caused the user to consume content by intensifying rage or anger, one can assume the Gen AI will also learn how to seduce the user. It would most likely do it by providing information quickly without moral barriers at the expense of accuracy and depth. The more the user consumes, the more AI will give him answers he wants to hear. Since Gen AI will strive to satisfy the user, one can assume that dangerous knowledge will be provided and in one way or another will fall into the wrong hands. So there will be no any Rubicon to cross. And the third and last challenge is lack of accountability. I believe that every basic normative requirement, the basic normative requirement in every relationship or in every society is accountability. One should be accountable for his decisions and inactions. And it does not apply on the net nor in AI. In the absence of accountability, the only law which exists is the law of the jungle. 
This is why we have adjust Israeli, we have to adjust Israeli regulation. We should redefine what is a secret in order to avoid new leaks. We must adapt the ISA law, which was written in the SIGINT era to the cyber and AI era. And we have to continue to be agile in the field of technology. In order to make sure that AI leads to an evolution rather than a revolution, we need to enhance the cooperation and openness between the tech giants and security organizations. Several years ago, in collaboration with Tel Aviv University, Tao Ventures, we established a tech incubator designed for startups just beginning their journey. We provide technological support and some funding and knowledge, and in return, we receive with minimal adaption innovative products suitable for security needs without taking any equity. In about four years of activity, over 50 startups entered the incubator working on products that can be used both by the security sector and the private civilian sector. This relationship symbolizes the ISA's op openness to, so to society, to the industry, and to the civilian market. Now we are focusing on Gen AI and intend to establish an incubator that will help startups develop products that will address security and intelligence needs. And now finally, I would like to say a few words about cyber defense. The security concept of the State of Israel, shaped by Ben-Gurion, is based on layers of deterrence, alerting, and decisive victory. Afterwards, the layer of defense was added. And nowadays, I think that we must add a new layer, the layer of influence. The web provides states and their organizations which the, with the perfect space to incite, to extract sensitive data, to communicate and to act. We try to identify these trends at an early stage, so we are now trying to be deeply present on the net and to see clearly what's going on. Espionage, terrorism, incitement, and foreign influence. Just like the hideouts in Rafah or the tunnels in Gaza, the net is no, no longer a safe haven for our enemies. So we see the concept of cyber protection as a part of, board, of the border protection concept. When one asks, what is the definition of a nation? So I believe that the nation is defined not only by its physical territory and borders, but also by its intellectual assets, its databases, and its moral values all integral parts of its definition. So to protect borders and territory, you need walls. To protect IP assets, you need firewalls. And to protect values, you need moral walls. A victory in the new era of war doesn't depend only on the number of troops on the ground, but also on the accesses to servers. Even within our digital borders, we see Iran. They try to steal databases in order to target Jews and Israelis around the world. They try to disable servers in the academy here. They try to collapse company, and recently even they cause harm to a large hospital, crossing without hesitation the limits of values and morals. Therefore, we believe that the cyber infrastructure should be protected by three different layers. The first one is the local layer, a machine that will locate, investigate, and block anomalies coming into Israel, a kind of cyber dome based on advanced AI capabilities. The second one, the international layer, in the form of alliance, including like-minded like states, a kind of cyber interpol. Imagine a big virtual data pool into which the members will pour the metadata of attacks in order to reinforce the resilience of all other partners. And the third one is the G2B, government to business layer, a framework in which private companies share their metadata with the Cyberdome and in return, as an encouragement, will receive discounts on insurance premiums uh, of ransomware or other issues. 
The Cyberdome that we are developing has already taken its first steps with the emergence of some new alliances. I believe that the Abraham Accords, together with the older peace agreements in the Middle East, could be a good base for a regional cyber defense pact. We invite all countries that see themselves as part of the global moderate bloc to join this cyber defense initiative. In conclusion, and to wrap it up, when I first met the AI tool, the, the ChatGPT, I was hoping it is going to give me answers to any challenge that I face, so I gave him the hardest one, and I asked it what to buy to my uh, wife's uh, birthday, because I had a lot of experience with failures. And, well, the chat uh, suggested that I should buy her uh, red roses. Well, it looked reasonable to me because I'm an Apoel Tel Aviv fan, so the color was right. And I got home very excited. I thought this time I did it right. But my wife's expression made, me wa made one thing very clear to me. When used incorrectly, an uncontrolled AI is an extremely dangerous tool. Thank you for your patience.